Okay. I guess that's one way of using big tech. Well, I mean, the app is streaming, right? They they basically have what 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 I think big tech has done is they'll take any industry and they take their cut of 30% by adding a convenience app and mm-hmm. then reduce the value of that business. Mm-hmm. And that's what they've done to movies. I mean, you don't think of a movie that that premieres on streaming the same way you think of a film premiering in theaters. You just don't. Right. And the movie going experience is dying. For, for you don't don't let I mean, the numbers tell the story, but also the numbers if they were honestly told, the numbers are fewer people are going to the movies. It's a habit that's been broken. And it's a habit that's been broken by a lot. I don't think movies are going away. I don't think they're going away. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, movies didn't kill radio. The drive-ins didn't kill, you know, the, the movie theater. Uh, television didn't kill the movies. Uh, it's it's an evolution. But certainly the audience that goes to the movies with any regularity, that audience is shrinking. Although I was encouraged to see that on this past weekend, which was... Uh, Batman Day, um, they played Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight movies, all three, at various times throughout the weekend at a lot of theaters. And I just checked, just sort of curious, packed. They were packed. See, and when I hear things like that, Chris, that's where, like, I mean, I'm not going to sit there and say you're wrong that there's, that the theater experience isn't on the verge of a change. I don't know about dying, but it's when I hear things like that and we have, like, the Taylor Swift situation and when, you know, when we, the lockdowns first happened, you know, my drive in nearby was had opened up for the first time in a decade and it's been open ever since. Like there's something changed. And I think it's more so where, you know, going off the tech thing that you guys were just talking about, instead of embracing the tech the way they should have, the studios got greedy, right? Instead of looking at it like, wait a minute here, we just eliminated one of the most costly things in the chain of our distributing a film, right? We no longer have to use film we no longer have to get it developed we no longer have to deal with the you know the nastiness of editing on a negative and dealing with all that business we no longer have to deal with putting out a bunch of prints to all these theaters and having to deal with that expense and all those things were eliminated so instead of putting the cost where they should have as usual they just balloon their budgets even more somehow by paying actors too much more by doing all these excess things adding so much cgi to the the film that it's literally every shot has a bit of CGI on in it. Like the last few DC films, for instance, it's gotten to this point where people are just tired of, they, they know how the, it's just like, they don't want to see this new thing. They've rejected almost everything new wholeheartedly as sans a very few random things like a Barbie or whatever top gun two, for instance, other than that, like this year has shown me one thing that the audience has just done with new Hollywood, but you put something that they know and they love in there, they'll go see it. You put Taylor Swift in there, they'll go see it. People want to go to the theater. People want to get out. They want to have that communal experience. But you're 100% right is that the, the, putting movies on streaming is no different than straight to video. And that's the way most people see those. And and I, I we were talking a little bit about this last night on a podcast about where I first got started into this business was because of the McDonaldization of Hollywood. And then it transformed into this other thing. But the, that base is still there, right? This all stems back to them making quote unquote content. And that's when I first felt like, okay, something's wrong here. Instead of them treating these films and projects like they should be, they're just being treated like content. And they're just one thing, just as he, just like the other thing, not one is more important than the other. It doesn't matter. Just keep churning them out. And it's the same thing with these streaming services and going back. And somebody said in the chat, like there was no Netflix money. It's like, yes, there was, yes, there was Netflix money. But again, Instead of learning from the tech, the studios went the absolute wrong direction in realizing, oh, the only reason that Netflix is making all this money is because we're all putting everything on Netflix right now. That's why. Because everybody's buying Netflix, subscribed to Netflix, so that's where all the money is. There's one big pool of money right now. As soon as they started pulling their shit out and creating their own streaming services, then they realized, well, there's nobody watching these, or at least not enough people to where we can sustain these kind of budgets. Right. And this goes right back to what we've been saying before, whether it's a movie or a TV show, they're spending 200, 300, 400 million dollars. We're learning on some of these budgets. Right. Culture, because Valiant Renegade has been doing digging and doing a bunch more now. And we're finding out, as expected, 
all these Star Wars movies cost a hell of a lot more than what they said because they're just reporting the budget, not the yeah. actual cost. Yeah, and that and that's the thing is you get a reported production budget number, and that's what Valiant's been saying. You know, of course, a lot of us has been saying these movies are way more expensive than they're telling you. Uh, but no, he's been able to hunt down every corporation, every shell company that is involved in production of these things. Not just obviously, you know, in the case of uh, uh, the the new show coming out, uh, Acolyte, the Blue Stockings thing in the UK, but everything that's associated with those types of of other other otherly coded corporations that companies house has to keep track of. But even the stuff here in the United States has, has its own little bit of shell company operating and they are, they are, they have a budget to get whatever part of the process together for the production of these films. And as Valiant has revealed, I mean, you're looking at several hundred million more dollars going into the production of these shows and movies that is not being reported elsewhere, which is why in some cases, right now, twice what they reported initially. In, Exactly. And, and and that's why right now Valiant's a rock star and the mainstream media can't ignore him. And so they're using him. So he's doing a good job. Well, and we've been kind of alluding to this for a while that this doesn't yeah. make sense and you can't keep reshooting these movies and this budget only be this low. Yeah. Right? right. Like that's the thing. And that just takes it all back to what we were saying before is they're not using the tech the way they should. And, and I agree with a lot of the things that the uh, script was saying and, uh, yeah. yeah, it's going to it's it, it, until they figure this out. I don't know. And I, I don't want to believe it, Chris. But yeah, it's going to be Hollywood's fault if the theaters it, fail at this point. Look, look, big tech is like the mafia. They are. They yeah. come into an industry. They take their cut and, and, and they come in there with this wild. Oh, we're going to blow up your business. We're going to do this. Your business is going to be huge. Streaming is a lie. And you're seeing the results of this. Mm -hmm. And the only way to get out of it is to. Uh, not be a part of that system. Or I would recommend to every single screenwriter out there, uh, hire yourself. Just become a producer. There's literally no qualifications to be a producer. <laughs> There's no school. It's very There's true. No, you it's need to true. do absolutely nothing to be a producer. Well, you need to have money. You need to have money to be a producer to a degree. You need to know how to raise money. That's why most producers start out as people who just come from money. So they come from money and they're filled with ego and, and they're via and narcissism so that they don't have to work a traditional nine to five job to make money. And all of their friends are rich. So they know where to go to raise money and they understand money. Well, guess what screen or Mr. Screenwriter learn about money or partner with somebody who does, you know, um, I, I have always said filmmaking is a team sport. So, you know, find out where the weaknesses are on your team. Like, uh, you know, the Detroit Lions this weekend that, you know, they were undefeated, but now they're, they've suffered their first loss. I'm joking. I watched football yesterday, uh, this past. Anyways, forget what I just said about football. <laughs> Uh, become a producer. I mean, that's look, I did that with my first uh, feature that I made back in 2005. I was like, I've written, I spent, and I got really angry. I spent like a year. I wrote a script with a friend of mine. I came up with a pitch that was hot for a weekend. My script almost sold. And, and I was like, I spent all these years. I, I said to my friend, my buddy, Arthur Borman, I said, we've spent all this time, nothing. We have nothing to show for it. We have nothing to show for. We don't have a, the next movie I come up with. I'm just going to make the fucking movie. And that's what I did. And I, you know, partnered with a couple other screenwriters. We wrote this script called my big fat independent movie, which I'm going to, I'm going to release it on digital and do a special edition Blu-ray that'll be out early next year. I'm working on it right now. I tracked down the director and the other, the financier. I, we're just like, let's just put this out. We'll do a, you know, 20 year anniversary edition of this, of this, you know, spoof comedy. But the point is, is I got frustrated and said, it's the only way to do it. I mean, that's why you see the, the people that are smart, they become producers. Tom Cruise is a very successful movie star. He is also a producer. And I was uh, recently spoke with a guy who's on the editing team for the dead reckoning part two he said that nothing is done and no action sequence is done until Tom says it's done. He personally approves and oversees every action sequence from the film. 
from uh, the, I mean, he worked himself into that position, but now like, I think that's why these movies are so good. He's thinking about the audience. He's not thinking about pleasing a, a percentage of wacko, wacky, crazy mob on social media. He doesn't care. He cares about the audience and what will bring in, you know, satisfy an audience in the end. So my advice to screenwriters, get off the picket line, um, you know, become a producer and just work on making something. I have uh, my friend, Jim Agnew, who's uh, was in, I interviewed on, uh, on the film threat channel. You can look up that interview. He just speaks very frankly about how effed up this is. And this is just going to kill. It's going to make things weak. And when you look at like the, the longer the timeline goes with this stuff at the end, like it's, it's, um it's, I feel like people are turning against the writers. I mean, I went to a film last week, just a screening of uh, uh, a movie, this little animated movie called The Inventor. And they were protesting that because the person who was the projectionist was not union. So, um, I, I, you know, and I, I just, I have friends who work on below the line jobs, below the line jobs. Uh, those people have to be effing pissed. They've got to be effing pissed. Those are the people that are no now no longer working because Drew Barrymore buckled. And I get it. I understand. But um, a huge independent film movement, I think, is is one way out of this. And that will result in more interesting work. No, we, we already have someone associated with this channel doing that right now. Tom Conkle, independent film, Island yeah. in the Stars. Uh, it's crowdfunded. They already, I think they have 90 backers right now and 15% funded. Yeah. I, I, I'm about to back it myself because I think it looks amazing. I think it's a great idea. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. yeah I just, um, if you go to the film threat YouTube channel on the community tab, I just posted about this. Um, there's a web series now about a, a guy documenting how they made a movie for $2,500. Now I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's a good movie. Okay. $2,500, you know, you get what you get. But it's a good learning experience. It's a way to cut your teeth. And with a solid script, in spite of budgetary restrictions, you can make something interesting. My advice to any indie filmmaker would be if you're looking to put production value in your movie, um, cast and location. Those are the two things that will make your movie look expensive. Yep. And cast, I, cast, ironically, but, but cast, ironically, what well, you're, two, real you're quick, just... two, two real quick things and then i'll throw to you paul but um sag you can make an indie movie right now with sag actors go to yes, sag can. indie there is a contract for indie filmmakers it gives a little bit of the power into the into the actor's hands but i if they still the website is still up at sagindie.com it's a different contract than the sag contract and uh location you've got to be creative sorry paul i cut you off but i just wanted to finish my comment no. uh, and i was but, eating while i thought you'd talk longer I'm sorry. Oh, no. Sorry, Paul. Well, no, no, it's okay. Uh, we just need to coordinate this better. Um, <laughs> uh, ironically, one of the things you're talking about uh, is that you're talking about actually using the technology that Silicon Valley has created to be able to marshal and create an independent production environment. I think that's ironic. Well, no, th the thing is, it's like, look, I held on to the rights 100% for my Blu-ray. So no, I no, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking movie. about Tubi. Like you can get your stuff onto Tubi and still maintain your rights. This That's never exactly. existed. Well, there's before. another. There's several different companies I can talk to you about it. I, I, I talk about this on Film Thread a lot, but one of the companies is called Film Hub. They're just a way mm -hmm. to get your movie on different platforms. You decide where it goes, and you can decide. And it's an 80-20 split, so the filmmaker gets. 80% of the revenue based on digital sales and or it's AVOD or TVOD, right? TVOD is transactional video on demand. That means you pay to buy or rent. AVOD is advertiser uh, driven video on demand. So, um, and both can be fairly lucrative, right? So I just think that the whole thing is you have to scale the budget of your movie to, to a degree that it'll be successful um, in those realms, you know? Um, the most successful indie producers that I know, they, they are involved with about seven movies a year and usually one or two hit the other mm. ones do not. And that is just, 
Well, it's kind of a smaller level of what the studios used to do, actually. Correct. But no, you're 100 percent right, and that's what I I can't quite figure out, Chris, is that why people haven't figured out because we get this question constantly, and I'm sure you do too, about you know how do I make my own movie? Where where do I start? And all this other kind of stuff. It's like the hurdles to make a movie now have been taken down so low compared to what they used to be that if I if I was you know 16 and chomping at the bit like I was at that time. And I could make a movie digitally like you can now. I would have made a million movies by now. See, that's well, what I don't understand. Yeah, but the, the problem I is mean, when they make good, you're right. Um, I'll just say, I'll just say, you're only just like Russell Brand said. You're only as old as the girl you feel. Oh, so. but uh, no. But that being said, like, it's like no. I I, I, I I see that for some reason there's got to be like some mental. Thing that's stopping people or the studios are getting in the way somehow or something's nope, it's getting there it's, it's just it's, i don't know what it is that's stopping it's people make a movie it is, say, it's hard to make a movie it's hard yeah, to make yes. a movie that's, that's good and it's hard to make a movie that's bad it's not an easy thing it's not something you can just get hey write a novel hey write a screenplay a script i get that yeah, you know, no no it, it's, it's primarily the teamwork you need more than one person in order to make a movie and guess Correct. what so many people get bored because the excitement runs out really quick once you're done filming and they don't want to be watching the same thing over and over again for months on end, editing it, sound mixing it, putting in special effects. They get tired. And if you and if you don't have enough money to pay them to keep them around, they walk away. You have tens of thousands of independent productions that start up every year that never get finished because of that type that. of stuff. And I've been there and I know how that works. But my thing is, is that what used to it's, it feels like there's some kind of barrier somewhere because. It used to be that we used to get all kinds of indie voices. Now they're just being lost in the shuffle. I don't know what it is or if they're being. No markets aren't out. the same anymore. There's that, that too. Right interrupt. Yep. I don't know, but that's the kind of thing is I'm trying to tell people for years. They're like, well, what should I do? Just do it. Just get out there and do it. Now that you, you have, you have finish the ability it. to do it and finish okay. it. Yes. Look, but get people I, who are committed. That's one of the biggest problems. Yes. It. There's, there's, I'll tell you, there's a filmmaker. Look this guy up. I interviewed him on the film threat website. I'm, I'm going to share it. He is one of the worst filmmakers I've ever known. And, and we're talking about, and I'm a fan of trauma, right? Like Neil Breen? I love trauma stuff. This guy's name is Bill Z. Bub. Oh. I'm not joking. That's his name. Bill Z. Bub. Yeah, All right? Z-Bub. Bill yeah. Z. Bub. I have heard that name. Is is he the one who did like Samurai Cup or something? Or he he made a movie called the worst horror movie me- ever made. He made a a movie called um, he's made movies where the titles are so offensive. I don't know if I should say them out loud. Um, I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna. I, I think I yeah I think I know. Well, he did not make uh, Samurai Cup. Sorry, but he has one made... of one of his best movies is a movie that I saw years ago that I played at a film festival. We did a special screening of it at the Arclight Cinema in Hollywood. It's called Ass Monsters. <laughs> Ass Monsters is about, it, it, it's, it's about a filmmaker who sees these crappy movies at horror conventions being sold at, at booths on VHS. And he's like, these movies are so bad, I'm going to make a movie. It's very self-reflexive. But it's it, I think it's his best film. It's hysterical because it's, it's very self-aware. There's tons of nudity in it, so I know Paul will like it. Like, <laughs> it's just, um, I, I'm what I'm saying is, is that he, this guy, has made so many movies. He doesn't give an f. He makes his movies for like, you know, less than twenty five hundred dollars. He doesn't care. He gets actresses to be in it. Like, um, I don't know what are some of those some of those cheesy low budget scream queens anyways well, he basically gets, he gets like those who are rejects from pay from playboy and penthouse right if they don't want they're the ones who are going to go go to him like the, the the ones who are like okay it's either this or it's porn yes That's who no, he gets. Look, a, a great producer once said that tits are production value and on that level there's no shortage of uh, uh of actors that you can find to you know appear in your movie naked I, but here, here's here's just check out this I, I put the link in in the private chat if you want to uh this interview that i did none of his movies are good 
I mean, they're terrible. But he just goes to horror conventions. He has a table. He sells his movies. He puts them out on Blu-ray. He has a process. The thing is, is that the the thing is for the low budget filmmakers and and film studios like Full Moon Entertainment or Troma that are successful, they have a process. They make a movie for a certain amount of money. They know the market will pay this. They make it for less than what the market will pay equals profits. That's it. I'm not sitting here telling you should try to make Oppenheimer or Barbie. No. If the studio does. What I'm saying is make something. I know that there's this um, Epic Verse Studios. I really want to talk to those guys because they're talking about making short films and this. It's like, just make the thing and sell it. If people will pay you money, then you know you've done your job. But, uh, you know, focus on some of these small. Well, how does Troma succeed? Troma even has an app. You should subscribe to the app. It's like $4.99, okay? Less than the cost of, it's about the cost of renting one movie on Amazon, okay? Um, yeah, yeah, and Full Moon has yeah, one Dr. too, Dr. and they, they make yeah. movies for just a couple thousand bucks a piece. And that's yeah, what I'm talking good. about is, look, and I get it. It's yeah. tough to get people to commit, and it's tough to do it without any money, but here's what you do. You basically get a really good way of recording sound. You get a really good camera. It doesn't have to be, like, really good, but, like, good enough to where it's, like, shoots in 4k doesn't look like garbage get yourself some decent lighting have a decent script go read robert rodriguez's book and go basically yeah. like that's really all you need to do and you just every time you keep doing a project even start with short films short short things things you can do that you have around you right well, and people well, you know that you can bring in and stuff like that that's the, the best is, way to start i just gotta say you can criticize trauma and full moon for releasing bad movies Hollywood releases bad movies. Yeah. There's yeah. No correlation. There is no correlation between budget and quality. Period. There isn't. Did you see Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny? You know what I'm talking about. There's Absolutely. no correlation for money equals quality. No, you're not. All right. anyone cares about at the end of the day is if a movie made money. You made the film, it cost this. The movie brought in X dollars. Doesn't freaking matter and trauma and full moon entertainment are both reputable companies that regularly go to the american film market you want an education in film go to the american film market in santa monica in in uh california and walk through the hall and see the kind of movies that sell go to the can film market not the festival the market okay go to the can film market it is literally seeing how the sausage is made no one gives a shit if a movie is good, okay? No one cares. Doesn't matter. It's did it did it make money? Did it sell in X number of territories? You know, I, that that is the important thing. You can you can you can, and and you know what? At, when you look at early works of a lot of filmmakers, their stuff was garbage. I mean, Oliver Stone made a movie called The Hand, right? Mm -hmm. We could all name crappy movies. James Cameron got fired from Piranha too. Right. I mean, look at the, look at the, <laughs> this is how you cut your teeth and you learn, you learn making a bad movie, worry about, you learn about making a bad movie that, that you finish first, then go and make a quality movie. If that's what you want to do. And if you're sitting there going like, well, I don't want to make a movie, but movies are teams. You can literally, the producer is the one who hires everyone and sort of puts the project together if it's not motivated by a director's vision with a, a director who's both written and plans to direct a film but the producer is the one that puts the pieces of the puzzle together and there's no qualifications for being in that job that's why the amptp right. is just such a joke that like you let these people have the power like you have the power you're writing the stuff you have the power yeah just just the make, one thing okay. I, I want to mention that is a caveat for independent producers is that it has to be properly papered with contracts yes. because it's not the, mm -hmm. it's not the first instance of its release that can be problematic is its future. If it's successful at all. Right. And then you've got all these people who you got favors from, or you haven't paid or it wasn't really clear what it was that you promised them, it's going to come back and bite you. So all these companies like Trauma, which I, I don't know personally, but I guarantee you the one thing they do properly is paper their productions, and it's the one thing that amateurs do not do. 
Yes, so. and those contracts are really e you can find like a legal. Oh, no, no, but I'm those, saying that they don't do it at all. Right, right. They have too many people that they've they've asked favors of. I hate asking favors of people. I, anything I do, I pay everybody. Well, the the other thing is is that um, if you do plan to release, you're going to have to spend. It depends on the type of movie, but you're going to spend at, at least a couple thousand, if not. I spent about five thousand dollars on an attorney. Uh, my movie was very talking about Attack of the Dock, which right. by the way, Attack of the Dock is sold out. Oh, nice! Uh, you so can you managed well, to pay your attorney. Did did you? Pay your uh, attorney? Well, I'll tell you about the attorney in a second. I'll tell you exactly who the attorney is, how to get in touch with that person. But what so real quick. Cool. So, so yeah, so Attack of the Dock, our first runs, I thought it would last us till the end of the year. It did not. So we are doing a second run of Blu-rays. They'll be in stock by the end of October. You can pre-order it now. Um, Attack of the Dock. Um, uh, get it. Uh, but okay, so the attorney I use is a guy named Michael Donaldson. But I use this attorney specifically because Michael Donaldson is the one who came up with the fair use argument. The fair use argument is that Michael Donaldson's philosophy is a documentary filmmaker, someone reporting news, should be able to use any footage in reporting the news or reporting on on uh, or or doing a documentary that talks about a thing. So he basically came up with arguments for why I had the rights to use the majority of the footage that's in the documentary. And we use footage from movie, a movie, uh, revenge of the nerds. We used footage from G4 TV, we used footage that was privately shot. Um, so all of that was cleared through Michael Donaldson. They wrote an argument. So if anyone does try to come to me legally, we have this document and I loved reading it because I've worked uh, enough in this industry now where I can read something legal and understand it. Uh, script. Huh. I'm sure that's the same for you. Oh yeah. <laughs> understand it yeah. so so yeah. Uh, yeah that's the one thing so properly papered is the important thing that's effectively mm -hmm. what a producer does it keeps track of knows where all the bodies are buried has the paper so that when you go to a film festival you can sell it so that means you you you're not using you you hire a compo i hired a composer actually i hired a composer and then i hired zach selwyn to do songs for attack of the doc Right. Like, and they also have the rights to the music outside of the documentary. So the soundtrack for Attack of the Dock is on Spotify. And they're making all the money from that. And good. I want, because I could not pay them very much. Um, I, I'm like, hey, make money on the soundtrack and we'll. No, it. but that's because you, yeah, you were making, but no, and, and I, I, I'm glad Paul brought that up because that's a very good oh, point. Because, oh. yeah, because once you get to a situation where money gets involved, all friendships are off. And everybody who, well, who, yeah. well, it's not just, I'm not saying that it's like, but that's the thing is like all of a sudden, sir, I wrote, directed and did all this work. I own it. I got all the fucking th rights. And then that person gets all the fucking credit and runs off with the movie. And that's like, what are you going to do if you don't have any paperwork on it? You're fucked. Right. It's like, it just, yeah, it goes along with all those things is yes. Definitely make sure you've got your paperwork in order as well. That's a big thing as well. I agree. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what the producer does, right? So, and, and there are producers that are creative producers that I believe genuinely add to projects. And then there are producers who are not creative, and they're producers filled with ego that can ruin projects. Uh, Caffeine Kennedy. I'm going to call her Caffeine Kennedy because she, didn't she? Maybe that's I just the that coffee thing? thing. Yeah. The coffee the, thing? It kind of fits. Yeah. If oh, uh, it, you, can actually, you can actually buy oh, that. You're kind of quiet there. You can actually buy that mug over on WW Pro's website right now. Oh, Captain. for real? That's a th okay. Cool. Good for him, man. No, what are you saying, Paul? Afford it, uh, find an experienced line producer. Yeah, and and stay out of the uh, the main parts of getting your project done. I've I've been very lucky working with brilliant line producers who made me look smart. Well, and you said, you know, the other thing you said is make sure people are paid because that's important too, Paul, because that was kind of what I was getting at is like all these people put all this work in and if nobody gets paid or you don't have it down in writing exactly who who did what for, for what monies, when the shit hits the fan and the money is coming in, that's when everybody starts to want to cash in, right? Oh, and, and if and you don't have like it. An asshole by going up to people, oh, just do this thing for me, you know? Oh, that too, yeah. yeah. Well, that's how you lose. Well, that's where mostly, and, and look, it's, Making a production is expensive, it's difficult, and it's hard, especially when you're making it with your friends. 
And like script was saying is getting people who can commit to this stuff is the toughest part. Trust me. I know that because you can spend all the money in the world on everything else and expect your friends to help you with, you know, being a grip or being an actor. And they're going to take off on you eventually because there's other shit to do. Right. So like, yeah, like, no, it is your business. Yeah. You have to know how to schedule. You have to make sure you have to also prepare people when you're getting involved with with, uh, such a project is that, um, you're going to be looking at the same stuff over and over again every day for the majority of your year. And yeah. that's how it is because editing is not easy. Uh, that it is the third time, fourth time for some people when you're trying to actually make a movie that from start to finish and it's tough. And then the other part too, is, uh, I have lost count with how many deals I have walked away from because they wanted to do contracts of deferred payment. Deferred payment contracts are BS. You, you don't do that. You get either a little bit of money up front. Or, or you just walk away and do something else, something else, because guess what? Deferred is always going to be a, uh, a lark. You're never going to see a, see a dime on what you're making, especially if you're a, an actor or anyone else in, in production and you're actually trying to make some work, you're, you're lost because they're trying to essentially say, oh, this is guaranteed. We're going to sell this at a film market and you will get something. And at most cases, it's never usually that way at all. That's against WGA, though. You cannot. Do it, it's against every union <laughs> in in um in in the industries, uh, whether it be Canada or the U.S. But I've seen a lot of independents do it, and I'm like, nope, we're I'm leaving, <laughs> getting out of there. That's going to be a nightmare. This clip was taken from Midnight's Edge in the Morning, which streams live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific time on the Midnight's Edge main channel. There, you can send in your live questions and comments before clips and full stream replays are uploaded to Midnight's Edge live archives. We are also on Twitter, Rumble, Odyssey, and Facebook, so smash that like, help share, subscribe, and join us.